Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Show Me The Money podcast. This is the second episode um, where myself and Mark talk about the uh, secrets of unlocking property finance. Um, For those of you who've not listened to our podcast before, um, I'm Ro Sharma. I'm a property investment developer based in London. I've got experience doing HMOs and I also work with young professional tenants as well as supported living uh, for housing associations. And I also do planning uplifts, working on joint ventures with vendors coming from a background of construction, project management, finance, and the military. And a quick uh, reminder of Mark for everybody. Well, mine, mine's um, less long-winded than that. I'm, I'm a broker. I find the money for people and uh, hopefully make their dreams come true and becoming millionaires through property. Um, so <laughs> it's Amazing. It's uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it's a bit more succinct, um, but yeah, in essence, we've both got the same uh, aim and goal to make money for ourselves and make money for other people. Absolutely. So, um, Sophia, myself, and Mark actually met out in Mithin uh, earlier this year, and like, after you know having enjoying some uh, fine food and wine, we uh, had discussions about three, you know getting this series going and and bringing on some really helpful uh, in, insightful guests such as yourself um so thanks for joining us do you want to give us a bit of an introduction uh, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, what you do uh, your background and i think this conversation is just going to flow really well from there yeah of course of course thank you for having me on to the first one I feel quite honored actually to be invited on as your first guest but um yeah i started off at natworth and rbs and your corporate and commercial banking really and i think for me, I've always really had a property interest, just purely because my family are all in property at the minute. Um, so from then on, I moved to Challenger Bank. So I was at Synergy Bank for a couple of years doing property investments, so your buy to let and your development finance. And then I moved to Avonmore. So I'm now at Avonmore as a relationship manager covering London, and I'm just doing development finance and bridging here. Wow. And... Uh, so we have a crossover all three of us we both yeah. all three of us have worked for rbs um which, there we go <laughs> yeah and none of us at the same time though ro I, I was there 2004 to 2007 you were a bit later were you so i was, I was actually at barclays but oh. um i did when oh. i was management consulting we did do a bit of work with rbs or i remember certainly doing quite a few pitches there um uh, for consulting work so i didn't specifically but some of my team did Mm-hmm. And uh, how about you, Sophia? When were you there? I was there between 2016 and 2018. So I was wow. in the Gatwick corporate team. Wow. With um, one of our my friends, Ian Collins. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually in his team. <laughs> yeah. Nice guy. He runs runs a, um, a, a mod type shop in yeah. Beckenham or somewhere now. That's anyway. it. Yeah. Small, Small world. world. <laughs> yes. So. Everyone's today... connected. It, that's how it is though in property everybody seems to know everybody and I suppose that's one of the great things about um this podcast is bringing people together and talking about property and how people su- can succeed from property so you mentioned Sophia you're from uh, Avermore um yeah. I I know Avermore very well we've done a lot of transactions do you want to tell us a bit about Avermore and where they sit in the market yeah, of course. So we are still quite a young company. We've been going to, since 2015. We started off as a small team, about four and five. Um, really and truly, I think we kind of built our name in the market because we innovated a product for part complete development, which is funny enough prior to COVID as well. So it was um, stepping in at any stage of the build. So if someone, you know, there's a lot of reasons this could happen. You know, we went through a period last year that unfortunately, contractors went bust lenders pulled out the market and that kind of thing so it's not necessarily something going wrong in a development but we like to step in and you know provide a solution to get the development finished and you know everyone's got that overall goal to get the deal completed and and move on to the next one kind of thing but overall we're a development lender that it's not just your ground up developments but we cover your refurbs and conversions say anything from you know, buying a house, doing it up and selling it on to your office to resi conversions, your extensions and that kind of thing. 
Um, but now we also do a lot of bridging. So we only really were known for to be like a development lender that only done bridging when there was a development angle on the back end. But kind of changed it up a little bit now where we've got fee scales, revaluations and legals and we're doing bridging just as quickly as our, our peers in the market, which is, which is good. Good. And you, you mentioned about the um, um, the development exit product. So yeah. part, part complete. Obviously, that's a, a, a riskier area yeah. of the, the the transaction to be to be working because if something's yeah. gone wrong um then you know that that causes extra risk yeah what telltale signs can a um a customer be looking at to make mm-hmm. sure they don't get to that point what, what sort of things can they be doing to protect against them making mistakes and having these issues and I, yeah. I don't want to talk you out of any deals because you, you do do the front bit as well. But <laughs> how can they avoid getting into trouble? I think it's just just doing your research, really. I mean, especially, I mean, we do support first time developers and that kind of thing as well. But just finding out, you know, speaking to the right professionals, ensuring that you've got enough of a contingency buffer in there. Sometimes you genuinely, you know, you see materials go up all the time. You're seeing delays in your bricks and timber and that kind of thing. Uh, really, it's just making sure that you've got the right costs. And also, so what, what is the right contingency? 5%, 10%? Generally, I like to see 10%. You know, yeah. if you've got a developer who's been doing it for a very long time, then 5%, 7.5% is it, generally okay. But yeah, 10%, I think is a good amount. I mean, some people were requesting 15, 20% on a contingency. You know, I think it's always good for the developer as well. Sometimes you go over on something that you're not expecting to go over on. And then you think, oh, now I'm going to eat up into a budget somewhere else. But but yeah, generally, I'd say about 10%. Okay, Ro, what do you put in yours, five or 10? It depends on the type of project. Um, If it's something I've done before, um, you know, if it's not been too long since I did that and there hasn't been too many macro macroeconomic um, impacting events, then I'd expect the cost to be broadly the same if I can evidence it. Um, so depending on the size of the, of the deal and the conversion or if it's a new bill, for example, will we'll dictate. I mean, 5 to 10% is what I've typically worked on. Um, but I, I guess linked to that as well, how do you... It'd be good to actually understand what goes on behind the scenes. So one, you know, Mark and I have discussed at length on previous mm-hmm. on the previous show, the process that that is involved in 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 borrowing and you know what happens behind the scenes and from the lender's perspective. So it'd be really helpful actually to perhaps if you could um, explain for the benefit of the audience kind of what happens when you receive an application first. Who who looks at it? So obviously we're working on the assumption yeah. that it comes via an intermediary, so someone like Mark at War Financial. What's yeah. the first thing you do? Which of the departments, departments I need to look at that deal? And how do you validate things such as the build cost and whether there is enough contingency in there? Um, it'd be good just to understand that that sort of process flow. And then um, I can probably ask a few more questions then about, about the build cost contingency and, and various other bits, which I'm sure you'll yeah. enlighten us with. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it depends how detailed the initial proposal is to us. Sometimes we'll just see you know, an address. This is the market value or purchase price you've got gdv and this is the build cost and they want the 12 month facility away you go kind of thing generally speaking with something like that i always look at the address i always look you know what's the area uh i generally look at comparables you know what what, what's sold in the area is their demand there over the past few years that kind of thing are they setting a completely new price point in the market you know so all of this stuff you always want to look at especially just looking at the location can I just ask a question on that? When you look for comparables, because that that's the one thing that yeah. we try and um, talk to our customers about and make them make sure they're realistic. So they they'll go yeah. on there and they'll say, "Do you know what? We we found this HMO, whatever. It's going to be worth five hundred thousand. And then you you look on net house prices, whatever it may be, and every other yeah. one has been sold for like two forty, two thirty, and you're like, yeah. definitely not. What is there a, a particular source or site that they can go on and look at um, sold comparables? I mean, for for me being in the sales team, when I see the in, initial inquiry, I will normally go on, on just on right move, look at past two yeah. years within a quarter mile, half mile. You know what what's been sold. Also, have a look at just what's in the market. Um, yeah. generally speaking with credit they'll probably delve into it a little bit more and, and have the better tools than what, what I'm using myself but but generally speaking I, I just go on to things like right move 
there's generally so enough you, data you do, there. So you do like the first pass. So you 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 yeah do the initial look at the application, and you do some cursory checks on the due diligence in terms of sold prices and that sort of thing. Yeah. What what else do you do before it goes on to the next person? Who is that next person, and then what do they do? Yeah, absolutely. So for me, when it comes in, I also look at the build cost. For me, it's, you know, if someone sends me a ground up development and it's less than £100 per square foot, I'm really going to back, back a little bit or just give a bit of feedback. Generally speaking, you know, there's a, a refurb and there's only about you know, this wind and water site and there's not much left to, to finish off and you're about £30, £40 per square foot would kind of make sense. Or, you know, if it is a self-build and they're not appointing a main contractor, then we might get comfortable you know the bill cost being a little bit lower than normal but generally speaking I think you know at least 150 pound per square foot when it's a ground up development especially in this day and age you know when we're seeing things on the back end one thing that we'll always probably pride ourselves in is we never actually lost money on a deal and I think when you've got enough there you know we do appoint professionals like your monitoring surveyor who will evaluate that but having that at the front end and being able to to give that advice you know how many days we've oh how many deals we've seen from from start to finish just being able to have that knowledge you know for example if you were to give me a deal somewhere in Kent you know we would have had one that we would have completed on recently you just that we can compare you know these are the build costs that they completed on there and and that kind of thing really so yeah generally that's as far as I'll go and looking at build costs myself but so from me, it will go to an internal relationship manager and credit analyst. So they will kind of review the deal ready for credit. And that's where they'll delve in a little bit more. They'll look at the full development appraisal. So they'll look at the full budget of costs from you know start to finish. They'll also have a look at the client's assets and liabilities. So for assets, you know, how much equity do they have in there? Generally, we like to see around 25% of the gross loan or something like that to, to kind of gain comfort. But that's when they'll have a, a real look into the actual client and who we're lending to, have a look at the borrowing SPV, that kind of thing. Um, and also experience, you know, looking at previous comparable schemes, if it's their first scheme, are they appointing a good contractor that has the experience? You know, have we got their details on file? And that's really like when it goes into credit, it's, probably where we delve into it a little bit more and could I just ask um you said you wanted 25 percent equity can that come from investor finance and if so what due diligence would you do on the investor Mm -hmm. who's putting in that 25 percent of course so generally speaking I mean we are okay we have had it before where you know there has been an investor involved but because they are part of the SPV that the clients actually put no funds in themselves and we've managed to get comfortable on that front so I think it, it all depends on how much the client has, you know, in, in terms of their net assets, if we do need a PG from the investor and that kind of thing. Is it, I think it's we look at everything on a case by case basis. But one yeah, thing I love. What, what we're seeing a lot of uh, yeah. and we, we go to a lot of networking events and we see uh, a lot of new start investors. They're usually looking to get their first deal and you do do first time developers. Yeah, and they can only do that with full investor finance, and yeah. that investor generally doesn't want to put a PG in. They just want to be away from everything. They want to stick their money in and get that money plus a bit more on the way out. And yeah. any risk, they just want to you know mitigate as much as possible. So, I think you're going to see more and more of that. In my opinion, that's mm. the thing I'm seeing on on the ground. But... It's, it's definitely quite common, and I think also. You know, it's on a fixed return, tends to be on a fixed return basis as well. So it's, it's effectively debt rather than uh, an equity type of investment. And as yeah. Mark said, they don't want to have exposure to personal guarantees and don't want to be on the SPV. So in that sort of circumstance, how, how, how do you deal with that? Because that is certainly something that people will be listening to uh, have looked at or have done before. How do you how do you go about yeah. reviewing those sorts of deals? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of the time that we will see deals where the client has got strong assets, you know, they just don't have any liquid cash or that kind of thing. Um, you know, you might see that they've, they're have they currently involved in two or three other projects and you can see that their money is there and, you know, they're clo- close to the end of the projects and they are going to sell it out and get some equity back in, in time. I think in a situation like that, we can be more flexible. Whereas if you've got someone who's, you know, probably a first time developer, they have never done any schemes before. They haven't got any assets of their own 
and there is a equity investor there that's probably when we're more likely to say actually can they join the SPV because normally yeah. you know we would probably wouldn't get comfortable with that client off standalone I'd say and another yeah. question off the back of that then yeah if you've got investor finance being put in and yeah. the investor is charging an interest rate mm -hmm. or you know a profit share that's obviously going to have an impact on the the figures of the development because the developer will be less likely to to make a profit if things go wrong because obviously their their profit would be halved or a lot of it would go away with the the debt servicing. Would that be taken into account as well when looking at figures? Yeah, definitely for us. I mean, generally speaking, when someone's got an investor, they will have a sort of breakdown of you know how they are going to charge it over the term and that kind of thing. So we will always account put that into our figures at the start so we have an overall sort of hard profit for the client generally I mean, we we say 15 percent, but we can go down to 10 percent, which is quite flexible in comparison to our peers in the market to be honest so yeah generally speaking we will look at that yeah and i 15 percent on the oh, so, sorry oh. i was just going to just ask a question about the uh, the profit so yeah. would that be 15 percent on the cost of the project on the or 15 percent on the on the, okay not on the gdv yeah 15 percent profit on cost okay yeah because i've i've done a well i was trying to do a transaction with you guys uh and the it was last summer and the yeah. the actual profit was coming down and down and down as materials were going up mm -hmm. and up and up and there were time delays and it ended up with myself and the underwriter discussing the project and saying this doesn't make sense for the customer anymore and we yeah. went to the customer and we said look we don't think this is the right thing for you to do we believe you'll be um, better off pulling out of this deal now than yeah. progressing with this. So we we added, I suppose, extra value to the customer as a sounding board and as a partnership between lender and broker where we had two people saying the same thing to the customer. You shouldn't be progressing with this. You're going to get yeah. yourself in a mess. And we, we probably, in you know, in hindsight, saved him a lot of money and time and um, he was very grateful, and he's he's still coming back to us with um, transactions now. So, I think we made that's, the right. That's a really interesting point because I think, especially as a as someone who puts deals together, you know, you put your heart and soul into it sometimes, and and everyone you know is at risk of becoming a motivated buyer, you know, because you spend so much time and energy in trying to make this deal work. Then the last thing you want to do is walk away from it because the you know the lender. Or, or, or your intermediary is actually advising you against it, but it's great that you do that because you need people looking at it from a fresh pair of eyes. So yeah. it's uh, really it, interesting to hear that. It was yeah. tough for me because I, as a broker, only get paid on deals that I complete. So <laughs> yeah, indeed, yeah. doing the right <coughs> thing was obviously the right thing to do, but yeah, yeah. it doesn't, doesn't pay the bills at the end of the day. That's it. I think when it, when it comes to profit, there's different ways you can look at it. For example, if you've got a client that you know they're doing a light refurb on a property and there isn't profit in that scheme, but there's a long term investment goal and you know it's a high yielding property, for example, then we can look to take a view when it is something like that. I think generally right. speaking, at the minute when it's actually ground up development and there's not much profit there, it's something that I'm probably saying more than I've ever said before is I think you're actually mm -hmm. overpaying for the site which is something, you know, that I never really said over the, the past couple of years, but recently it's something that I seem to be would saying. You, would you say, uh, and that's a really interesting observation, would you say that is more to do with um, deals that people had secured a price on probably six, 12 months before, or was that even, you're still seeing that on deals that people are securing now as well? Because obviously we are seeing this dip in capital values and, you know, I believe strongly now is a time, really, really good time to be doing deals, but I recognise a lot of people might have option contracts or prices that they negotiated 12, 18 months ago, possibly even. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'd probably say a bit of both, to be honest. There, there is there is one scheme in particular that we've been working on for a while that, you know, they put the price in a long while back. Um, mm. And they basically, I think there's a few problems that they've had. You know, they've had to apply for amendments in the planning and that kind of thing and i've said at this point you know the amount of money that you've actually spent on the site and you you've not even fully completed on the purchase yet i think it's probably worth negotiating on on that site now you know and there's more issues than probably anticipated at the start but yeah I'd, like you say probably a bit of both i'd say that's that's really nice i really like that you kind of you know you give some guidance advice to your borrow your potential borrowers as well to say that this is what you need to be doing to make this deal work other than 
you know, or rather than just say actually uh, no it's not enough in it we, we can't do this um yeah. so that that's really that's really interesting definitely i mean like every, everyone wants to make money and you know every deal potentially could fit your parameters and that kind of thing but it's never the right thing to just proceed with the deal if you don't think it's going to be profitable for the client as well i think that's a, I guess a big a great thing, thing for us yeah, that makes that makes complete sense because the great thing is that you've got the benefit of seeing deals all the time, so you can kind of benchmark costs, you know, land uh, acquisition values and all all yeah. sorts of stuff, um, yeah. which you know we as we as borrowers don't don't see. Cause, now, I've always thought it'd be really interesting to sit actually inside with a broker or or a lender and just be <laughs> there part part of the due diligence, you know, just yeah. absorbing all that knowledge and really seeing what goes on, what works well, what doesn't. How you know how things fly through and which things don't, and for what reason that uh, that can really help us with our applications. On that, Rob, I know you're a facts and figures kind of guy, and you like spreadsheets and things like that. I'm I got a lot of the time. Obviously, facts and figures are very important and the most important. But gut feel and assessing from experience, I suppose, is is really important as well. And you know when I. You know the escape room games that, that you do where you have to break out of a room? When my wife and I have done these in the past, she goes on looking at the clues and the facts and going through everything, and I just press stuff because I've got a gut feel that, you know, I've got to press this part of the wall to let me out. And a lot of the time in, in property development, you need that intuition and the the other side to it as well. So you can have all the facts and figures and everything work out, but... You, you sometimes you need to take a risk. Sometimes you you need to be looking at things that haven't worked for people previously because at the end of the day, people make money when other people aren't doing that thing as well and they're creating new trends. So for me, a big bit of advice for people listening are get your facts and figures. Make sure you, you have a tight ship, but then make sure you are also doing things innovatively and making sure that you are maximizing your potential by using your creativity. And then underwriters here, and they're like, no, we're not ending. Right. Makes sense. What sort of timelines do you guys work to at, at, at Evermore in terms of when you receive an application, how quickly yeah. can you turn around decisions and then obviously there's the actual drawdowns as well, which is what this is all about. Tell us a little bit about the process that needs to take place before the money is actually drawn down by the borrower for that acquisition on completion yeah. date. Yeah, of course. So we have heads of terms, which is credit committee every single day, basically. Um, it's not just, you know, the credit team. You've got our CEO on there. You've got our head of investor relations who deals directly with our funding lines. You've got our head of credit, head of underwriting, that kind of thing. Everyone kind of joins the call every day or in the meeting room every day. And generally, we just discuss every deal. You know, we've got our credit analysis and our internal relationship manager sort of sitting there presenting deals. And it's sort of not like a voting system, but to get everyone on board and, and say we're happy with the decision. We actually appoint an underwriter from day one once we've approved it. So a lot of people will okay. wait until, you know, reports have come back and then it gets handed over at that stage. Whereas we get an underwriter generally on a call with the client, you know, and um, the broker as well from day one. You know, this is what needs to get done. If, if you've got a timeline that you need to meet, we need to know about it now rather than waiting for the reports to come back. Like It does also help when we're requesting professional quotes on who can come out to cite the quickest if it needs to be done if it's an urgent case for example or you know some people have already exchanged by the time they come to us for full application so it's a, we've got 28 days from two weeks ago <laughs> that kind of thing so we we do like to to, to know up front you know, how quickly they like to complete and for us generally speaking you know we use professionals that can go out onto site next day you know that week next week that kind of thing so generally we'll get the reports back within a week or Two weeks probably max really um and then from then on once the underwriters are working on the case and it's going through legals i generally say two to three weeks of completion once we've received the report i think one thing i'd say is on your bridging when you've got quick purchases your refinances and your auctions and that kind of thing we'll generally get you know stage one valuations uh, out onto site the next day and uh, get your report the day after that legals are instructed on a fee scale and generally it's at, turnaround time is between 10 days to two weeks on that kind of stuff so it depends yeah. on the deal specifically i'd say okay 
That's, that's encouraging. And so in terms of the reports you would normally commission, obviously you've got your, your evaluations there who goes out. Mm -hmm. um, obviously you instruct the legals as well. Yeah. Once that's all, you know, once all the, the, the necessary payments have been made yeah. to, to initiate that. Um, anything else that uh, sometimes you you do need to commission as well, which maybe perhaps a little bit off the beaten track, but um, perhaps something you're seeing more of? It really does depend case by case basis, to be honest. I mean, we've had one recently where the client has needed to go and get a batch survey or this kind of stuff. We right. always get, you know, at the start, sometimes you might need a structural report, but it really does depend um you know it's not something that will request a standard a standard like for development it's just your monitoring surveyor evaluation and your legals and then for bridging it's just evaluation and legals but other than that i think it's all case by case basis i'd say yeah makes sense um when it comes to then the drawdowns for your yeah. um so let's say it's a refurbishment facility or, or a development yeah. facility after the um, the acquisition generally speaking people always need to spend money for the first kind of yeah you know for, for the first stage payment to then claim it back most lenders i've worked with or at least spoken to that's how they work is that is that standard for for you guys as well yeah absolutely i mean we will always draw down in arrears for me i think yeah. personally if you're providing the, the funds you know in advance then anyone can can do it at that at that stage you know for us, it's we've got an internal asset management team, so we also appoint an external MS to go out onto site. You know, they'll review, verify that the payments have been made, and they'll verify the costs that have been spent, and we'll draw down against their certificate. But at the same time, we also have an internal team of asset managers who will keep on top of the deal. So, for example, if there are any delays, we'll be on top of it. We don't ever want to be in a position that we're not that kind of lender that will just put a client on a default rate and you know wait for them to get out on their own we'll always try and find a solution to to make things work so it does help to have that team internally too right very good got a question for you on the because you mentioned obviously you you do a cursory review of all build costs and the applications yep. coming as well <clears throat> what are you typically seeing so like in the southeast let's say london for now yeah we're not talking prime central london but what are you seeing in terms of light refurb, heavy refurb, and then mm -hmm. new build cost per square foot? I'd probably say Rough, light refurb. Ranges. Yeah, light refurb, I'd probably say between 100 to £150 pound per square foot, really. Sometimes on when it gets a bit heavier, I'd say about 180 to about £200 pound per square foot. Um, yep. Generally, on your ground-up developments, at least £200 pound per square foot, I'd say, especially in your London and South East prime areas, to be honest, at, at, least, at least £200 pound per square foot. So... Mark and I discussed this the last time. Obviously, there's some people who manage builds themselves, and they'll yeah. put in quite low build costs because there's no overhead yeah. and, uh, and and um, and profit for a main mm -hmm. contract. For example, how do you view those types of applications where someone is putting a build cost that they can achieve, mm -hmm. but no one else would necessarily be able to achieve if if they if they went under? How how do you how do you typically deal with those uh, those sorts of assessments of build costs? Of course, I think for us, like, we're, we're always going to be in a position that we will take it into consideration if a client is doing self-build rather than appointing a main contractor. I think for us, that is definitely something that our MS will, will take into consideration. But I'll always say we like to fund at market build. We won't charge you if you don't draw the whole thing. But if at any stage we have to take over the build, unfortunately, we don't have those contacts that are able to you know, do it for £25 per square foot or wherever it may be, to be honest. So we always like yeah. to have that buffer there. You know, we won't, again, as I say, we're not going to charge you if you don't draw it. If you draw what you need, that's what you'll get charged on. But we like to have the full build facility there at market build, to be honest. Make, makes sense. And what about project management then? Because, again, a lot of people, um, for probably at the smaller end of the scale, will manage the projects themselves. What do you expect to see um, in terms of um, any allocations towards those management costs, if, if at all? Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, when it's uh, management costs there, some people will put them in, some people won't. I mean, we don't generally like to see them sort of paying themselves in the build facility. Sometimes you see quite a large amount in there. Um, we generally review those up front, you know, if they are on site and and that is what they're going to be doing. Then, of course, you're always going to cater for those management costs um, for a project manager. But it, it does depend. It, it really does depend on the case. You know, if you've got a light refurb and someone's being paid a lot more than normal, but they're not actually on site as much as expected. You know, to, it's only to watch to watch the paint dry. 
yeah yeah exactly that's it and it's only you know sort of a three month term and that kind of thing and you've got an extortionate amount then of course it's something that we'll probably look at a little bit more but you know if you've got a, a larger bill and it's something that someone's essentially doing a full-time role and they they've got a full full team behind them as well then definitely you know something that will be a little bit more lenient on i'd say that's very very, very helpful i think uh, i'm just watching watching the clock in turn we, we're covering some great content here but have you got any more questions that you you think we should try and cover with sophie in the last few minutes uh, I'm, I'm not so sure there's one that we're gonna gonna end on um to, to all our guests and that is the the top your top three tips for property investors or developers uh, that you could give okay i think first tip would be do your research um just not just on the area but also just everything the build that kind of thing i think it probably ties into another point that i'd say is just build a reliable network in terms of which professionals you're using could be your architects your contractors you know just make sure you're you can rely on the professionals that you're using you know you've got the you've had a look at their reviews you've had a look at their previous projects and that kind of thing so you know who typically you're going to be using on your scheme you know make sure they're trusted and that kind of thing and seek professional advice I'd say you know from a broker like yourself Mark I think it is quite important there's a, a lot of as you know it's very <laughs> very important exactly and you know there's so many factors that go into one development scheme for example that you just wouldn't even think of it if it's your first time and that kind of thing and even people that have done it so for so long they're so knowledgeable on how to get the project done but in terms of the finance that you know the market's constantly changing so just yeah i'd say seek financial advice <laughs> yes good okay well that's great thanks Sophia. um okay. i think We'll wrap it up there. Uh, thank you for coming on. And uh, we will hopefully have some um, some more great content in our show in two weeks' time. So we're going to put these on every other Thursday. Um, and hopefully people have enjoyed it and they're going to tune in going forward. So thanks a lot, Ro. Thanks, Sophia. And uh, we'll say goodbye to everybody. Thank you, Sophia. Thanks, Mark. Fantastic having me on. Thank you for having me on. Take care, guys. Bye.